<laughs> I hate you all. That's good. We're all off right, to a good we, start then. Can we do something now? Sure. All right. All right. Welcome back. This is so Jeff. We'll get to who you are in a minute, but we have no idea what episode we're recording. We, we do uh, know what season it is. Four. So if you want to know what episode it is, it's called Refer to the Title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best we can do at this point. I mean, it works. It works. It's better than a whole bunch of comments if you said this wrong or that wrong. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like it's like the guy who yelled at me. I'm, he seemed okay after I talked to him through the comments, but he was a little upset in the beginning. He's like, you guys don't take the time to introduce your guests properly. <laughs> we like to let the listener do something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got, so have you ever even listened to our podcast? I have not listened to the podcast. That is a good thing. It is a great thing. <laughs> oh, we're going to break them in right, ain't we? Yeah. <laughs> Expectations are where they need to yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the basement, so. Yeah. All right, we got the normal band of characters here. Oh, uh, my first and foremost co-host, Mr. Works a lot. Farmer Chris. No, Farmer Chris is the, uh, well, he's, he's, backup he's <laughs> yeah, he's, he's the, the backup, host. he's the backup co-host that has more appearances than my main co-host. <laughs> in season four. <laughs> in season four. But you know what? Our actual guest here is in more of my videos than any of you guys combined by far. Well, I'm glad I got that going for him. You do? Yeah. He's is, a, it, is it a positive? He, he's been in every video I've posted for the last year and a half. Oh, that's right. Because I'm in the intro now. Yeah. He's the, he's the guy. I get a lot of questions. Who's the guy in the intro? As the guy in the intro, would you consider that a positive? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's better to be in the intro than the outro, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. It's, and some would say it's better to be in there than not. Man, I can't put my Pepsi there. It blocks my beautiful belt. There goes the big head. Championship belt. Oh, you're supposed Wait to turn this until they actually start. Yeah, until oh, they, yeah. is Pepsi yeah. paying yet? Because <laughs> if, if Pepsi's paying, I think my fee is about to pay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, our last podcast was about math, and I'm not real good at it, but zero times zero is still zero. <laughs> well, shoot. <laughs> so we're, we're getting nowhere fast here real quick. So, oh, <laughs> excuse me. If anybody at Coca-Cola is listening, he's for sale. Yeah. You know, the first stock I ever bought was Coke. Bought five thousand dollars worth of Coke stock, and it paid for about a third of this house. Right. Yeah. And yet you drink Pepsi every day. Well, Pepsi, unless it's a common generator, then he Pepsi had an opportunity to pay for the other two there, and then take me up on it. <laughs> and you still support them. <laughs> well, anyways, how do we get this? This is what happens. We get way off subject. So I've got a good idea okay. to drive him up the wall. What's that? Next time you're down at the lot. Take some pictures of Lieutenant Dan for me. Yep. I'm going to send them on to Clint and get him to post it for sale at CNC. <laughs> oh, that is, that is low blow. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I last line of the sale, this is not actually for sale, whatever. Yeah. Well, I still think the funny part is, is Clint had to create a hashtag for everything you post. It's <laughs> not dirt perfect. <laughs> That's what made me think about doing it. <laughs> everything you post up there, hashtag not dirt perfect. Yeah. I'm still shocked he hasn't taken that new bed off and put on the Mac yet. Oh, it's coming. Yeah. Why would I take a bed off that actually works and replace it with a new bed? Because you're selling the truck and you got to use the bed for something. This podcast is not about which bed I use where. <laughs> this is taking a turn and we haven't even started. Oh, oh this is the way it usually <laughs> goes. Way so. go. It's the only time right. we can pick can on. Can we talk about the man in the intro, please? Sure. All right. Thank you. So, all right. So Jeff is uh, Jeffrey Dodge. Is that that proper, is correct? Proper name. Uh, me and you met. What, has it been going on three years ago now? I think so. So let's kind of go. Let's kind of cover the uh, like how we met, and then let's back all the way up to how you got here. So starting in the middle. <laughs> starting. Um, we're gonna start in the middle, go backwards, then go forward. Yeah. And then we're gonna go full circle before it's over. <laughs> Very good. So. Um, we have a little excavating business and uh, you're about what three hours north of me uh it was about two hours and 32 minutes there this morning he didn't drop speed limit i did not unfortunately <laughs> about eight state troopers that i passed on the way weren't paying any attention <laughs> at all <laughs> <laughs> where's he yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. well, he sleeping yet huh? <laughs> well he wasn't pulling a trailer so who, what, yeah, who, yeah yeah so uh <clears throat> I didn't have really any formal training or a family business that I grew up in or anything else. It was just kind of something we did. This so, is scary. This is the second guy on the podcast that had no training and somehow I showed up on my channel. 
So I was watching YouTube videos to try and figure out how to do things. And um, Let's Dig 18, you, a uh, couple others. And so obviously I follow those channels on YouTube and for whatever reason, one of your episodes popped up and in the background, I was like, man, that looks like go-kart tires. <laughs> I wonder talk about the random stuff people see in the background <laughs> and all the stuff in this shop. He picks out go-kart tires. I, I mean, wonder, I wonder if he likes racing because he's got a pretty good following and I don't. So I reached out and said, Hey, um, by any chance, uh, were those go-kart tires and do you happen to know what sprint car racing is all about? And you can take it from there, Michael. I can, I can fill in the spot here. Yeah. You was putting field tile in at the skunk house. You know exactly which job we were on, don't you? And, uh, hey, this crazy guy from Indianapolis. <laughs> we're going for lunch and might be working on a sponsorship with a sprint car. I'll be back later. <laughs> yeah, we were, well, he ended up coming to that job because he wanted to see the trench about yeah, it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we ended up going down to Marcy, so. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, I mean, not to get too far off on the weeds here, and this was three years ago, so it isn't as extreme as what it is now, but. Um, I get a lot of random people, especially, and I'm not talking about people like yourself, but we get inundated with like Chinese sponsorships and people pretending to be yeah. other people trying to get, I mean, Huber told the story the other day about some lady sent him a jump pack trying to get to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's just a, it, it, I don't have the time to filter through all the crap. You know what I mean? And, uh, I forgot, did you message me or email me? Email. And, uh, I don't remember. I don't remember either. I know we got going back and forth via email for a minute. Okay. And um, and you were pretty quick to respond. I was a little surprised. Yeah. Well, the reason I was probably quick to respond is, and I don't I don't want to, I don't want this to sound wrong, but you can tell by the way something is typed or worded whether or not they're in the industry or not, and whether or not they got experience or not, or whether or not they're legit yeah. and genuine or not. So I fooled you. Well, <laughs> you're a true race car driver. <laughs> Look what I can do. Look what I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> fake it till you make it. Yeah, That's fake right. it till you make it. So, uh, you know, Aaron works farming. He's he's a lot more of a dirt track guy than I was. I always had interest in it, but I, told, I think I told you the first meeting. I hadn't, like, I needed a reason to go. Like, just my, my love of the sport wasn't enough to get me to the track. you got a real good reason to go now. Yeah. And it ain't me. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you fixed that problem one way or another, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know what this guy wants or what, what opportunities he are, but he's at least worth the time for a conversation. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, uh, and we'll get into this later. The best part about that day is take all the business stuff aside. I mean, you just become good friends. Yeah. You know, so that's that's the biggest takeaway from all this. But yeah, I was like, Jeff, if you, if you want to make a trip down here and bullshit and talk a little bit, and uh, I mean, I, I don't want to make it sound wrong, but you basically had a sales pitch of here's what I've done, here's what I want to do, here's where I need help at. Mm -hmm. Be interested in being part of this deal. And uh, Gunner, he he's taken a liking to racing. Yeah, he closed the deal for me. And uh, <laughs> and Aaron's son Bo, he's pretty liking it as well and i'm thought and, and we'll talk about this later we're not talking about local yeah local no name sprint car racing i mean we're on we're world outlaws high limits big big boy okay trying to be yeah trying to be <laughs> and i'm like you know what this might be pretty cool something give me a gunner excuse to go to the track give us a reason to you know i don't care if jeff goes to the track and runs fifth or he runs or you don't make the show just having somebody at the track that you can help or cheer for or invest mm -hmm. in. Or take parts of the car home. Or... Take parts of the car home after he wrecks. <laughs> take oh the boy. Uh, it, it makes it a lot more enjoyable. You're, you're invested at that point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, And I don't want to put words in your mouth. The conversation went something like, hey, I got some credentials, but people are less interested in my credentials and more interested in my following, and I don't have one of those. Yep, that's He's, exactly it. Um, I guess maybe this is a good segue back to the beginning of the story. Yeah, but, uh, take it away. It, it's your podcast, even though I talk the most. <laughs> I can't shut his microphone off in the current setup. He, uh, 
he was smart this time, put you guys on the same mic set. Yeah. 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 I can't kill him in front of Damn, I didn't even see him do that. <laughs> um, no, uh, you mentioned earlier I was from Colorado Springs, and uh, my dad was a racer. Um, so I grew up watching my dad. Cool dude. He's pretty cool. I've got to know him a little He's bit. He's pretty cool. So I grew up watching my dad race on Pikes Peak, and he raced sprint cars too. And um, this would have been what eighties. Well, I was born in eighty three. Uh, my dad set a world record up there and beat Bobby Unser's record in seventy nine, which kind of started his career. Um, that had to be pretty badass. To oh hell yeah! Pikes Peak. <laughs> it was in those days. It was. I mean, not that it's. Pretty not cool now, then, yeah. but it, it, it was legit. Back. It was yeah. a it was a race. Like, then. like you it, were, it was a race then. Stuff, yeah. And you and were racing your uh, your commitment slash fear level as much as you were racing mm-hmm. yeah. anything. Well, I mean, I don't want to get too far off track here, but uh, I remember as a kid, um, my dad would go up in the mornings and leading up to the race, he'd go drive the road just to kind of get familiar with what had changed over the winter, and you know, obviously there's a lot of erosion and. Right. And kind of severe conditions at 13, 14,000 feet. So it's always a little different year to year. So he'd go up and start driving the road every morning. And I would go up and ride up in a streetcar with him, kind of leading up to the race. And the last hairpin before the top is the biggest <coughs> sheer drop on the mountain. And it long straight away into it and then you go from there and kind of up around a bend into the summit and uh we're coming up to this and my dad goes well this is this is the biggest drop off on on the whole course he goes you want to go look over and i was like yeah i said all right come on dad let's go look he goes no he goes i've never looked over that edge <laughs> smart man and i said why he goes because you'll never drive in as deep again <laughs> And so, uh, anyway, I grew up watching him do that, and, and that kind of planted the racing bug Sweet. pretty course, firmly. In those days, it was gravel. Or it dirt was. It was dirt. Then. Dirt. It was pretty Deep, wild up there. Crushed, crushed granite. Yeah, granite. Um, no guardrails. And if nobody knows what we're talking about, it's worth stopping right now on YouTube and yeah, racing Peak, up. Yeah. Pikes yeah. Peak. It is legit. Oh, yep. hell yeah. Pikes Peak Hill Climb, second oldest race in America to the Indy yeah. 500. Um, back in the day, everybody from Indy would come and run there. Um, so there was always kind of that indie connection and my dad wanted to wanted to be an indie car driver I mean that was that his was ultimate his, goal. his ultimate goal so I grew up kind of with the 500 on on that pedestal and uh, 88 was a pretty influential year in my five-year-old life uh, started off in May um, watched Rick Mears win the 500 and was like that dude is cool I want to be Rick Mears. Um, and then later that summer, got to go see my dad at a World of Outlaw race. <clears throat> Would have been, I think, over Fourth of July weekend. Uh, so a couple months later, and um, watched Steve Kinzer and Doug Wolfgang and Brad Doty. It was like the last, one of the last races before Doty got hurt. Um, and it was like, well, I don't know. I, I want to be Rick Mears, but this sprint car thing's pretty cool too. Yeah. Um, and got to be. I mean, the world of outlaws is a very fitting name for that. Not it, because there are a bunch of criminals running it, but it's just, it is so pure. Yeah. Racing. Yeah. I mean, 410 sprint cars, in my opinion, are the last uncastrated form of motorsports yeah. out there. Well, the car is so simple. You're so limited what you can do to it anyways. I'm not a sprint car guy, but was, you mentioned Kendra. Did he drive the channel lock car for a while? That would have been Sammy Swindell. Oh, uh, Swindell, okay. So but, uh, I but that's all right. I remember watching them at the Tri-State Speedway. Remember the channel lock car that just was kicking ass over there? Sammy was pretty good. Yeah. He was one of the big three for sure. You had Kinzer, Wolfgang, and Swindell were the three. Do you, not to get way off subject here, but do you think that's one of the reasons there's a resurgence of 410 sprint car racing coming back is because everything else has got so regulated and so controlled that that that's still one of the I don't want to call it wide open series is but it's still one of the that's uh, an interesting an interesting thought I had never really considered that um I'm not really sure 
exactly where our resurgence, I guess, is, is coming from. I mean, I think some of it is that maybe people today have a little bit shorter attention spans. Shorter, faster races. They're, it's a little bit, a little bit easier to follow than say a 500 mile race that just kind of goes on and on and on. You know, you've got to. Cause there's no, I mean, there, there, there is strategy, but the strategy is, is how fast can you get to the yeah, end? There's no mirrors in them for a reason. <laughs> Because uh, when they throw the green flag, you better be going forward because, yeah. uh, I mean, 30 laps might take seven minutes. Yeah. So you get races that pay a lot of money and it's going to be under seven minutes of time to make whatever you're going to make happen, happen. So, yeah. um, so, so back to back to five-year-old Jeff. So yeah, five-year-old Jeff was pretty much, that was the year that I was like, yep, I'm going to be a race car driver. And um, I don't think it really thrilled my mom. <laughs> I, think that's, I, think that's, I think that's pretty normal procedure though, right? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty standard. Did, you, um, did your mom support your dad's racing career? No, she hated it. Really? She hated it. Um, so it was no surprise whenever she didn't wasn't excited about yours it wasn't a shock no but he wasn't real supportive in the beginning <coughs> um, i didn't get to go to the races with him a lot because my mom didn't like to go so um and back in those days you weren't allowed to bring kids in the pits and stuff so it was kind of like well sorry yeah and so i'd i'd sit home and wait to find out what happened till the next day um and I, I don't know, maybe being kept away from it even made you want it yeah. worse, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Makes the heart grow fonder. Time exactly. Here. So uh, time went on and it was always like, Dad, Dad, can we get a go-kart? And he's like, ah, here's a baseball mitt. <laughs> Dad, Dad, can we get a go-kart? Uh, how about a hockey stick? <laughs> you know, like they, they kind of threw everything else at me. And um, I think I was like 13 or 14 and... I was determined to get started somehow. Somehow. And you were old enough at that point, you could start pulling some old resources. So I went and talked to my grandpa and I said, hey, grandpa, you know, you got a pickup truck. If I got a go-kart, would you take me to the races? And he was like, yeah, sure. And so I showed up at home and my dad kind of suspiciously looked at me with my new Taco Bell uniform at 14 <laughs> and was like, you're as lazy as the day is long. What is going on here? And it was like, well, you know, Grandpa said if I get a go-kart that he'll take me to the races, so I need to make some money so I can get a go-kart. My dad was <laughs> so, like... <laughs> so, hold on. The Taco Bell uniform wasn't a race uniform. It, it was an employee, 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 employee yeah. uniform. Yeah, no, it was the only place, <laughs> was the only place I, I could... I going race uniform. Yeah, I thought oh, he had a sponsorship wow. already. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, right damn. <laughs> no, no, it was, it, was, it was my own sponsorship, right? It yeah. was uh, the only place I could find that would... Uh, trade me some time for money at 14 years old that happened to be within bike riding distance of my house. Um, and it was a downhill run all the way to work. It was kind of a, not as much fun coming home. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so I started working at Taco Bell at 14, making burritos and tacos and, and uh, making some money. To my dad, I think he saw once, once I did that, that there was there was no stopping you there was no stopping and so he joined in pretty quick like i don't want to make it sound like my dad wasn't supportive yeah, he's right. he's been probably my biggest supporter through my whole career but but you had to prove to him that you were serious about it yeah so like back to the pike's peak thing he grew up racing with the uncers up there and and bobby uncer jr was really interested in trying to be a drummer in a rock band not be a race car driver really? but it was being shoved down his throat and I think my dad saw just kind of not having the respect of, of what it took to do the racing thing. And my dad knew it was a hard road. Like he, he had success early in his career and tried to move up through the ladder and, and get himself into position to, to go be an IndyCar guy and, and hit the wall that everybody does, yeah. which is, yeah, no, like you're pretty good. So go find yourself a bunch of money and Come we'll back. give you the seat. And um, I think he probably just didn't want to, didn't want to. He knew what road you had ahead. Yeah, of you. He, yeah, he knew he knew where it was going. He knew it was one that was littered with heartbreak and frustration and a whole lot more bad days than good days. And um, 
but I wouldn't trade, wouldn't trade yeah. it. No. So um, we started racing go-karts uh, kind of locally around Colorado and didn't have, you know, the real spectacular start that I had envisioned for myself. Um, but we got going and uh, kind of started to have some success in the local karting scene and win some races. So then it's like, well, let's go try a little bit bigger race and a little bit bigger race. And then we got to the national level of karting. Uh, would have been 2001, probably. Um, at the time, shifter carts were kind of just taking over everything. And I, uh, I don't think shifter carts get their true due of how dangerous they are and how fast they are. They are wicked fast. Mm -hmm. wicked that has fast. to be one of the most dangerous forms of racing you did. Maybe. Um, there was an incident in Portland, Oregon, that ultimately led to getting a roll cage. So, <laughs> um, so we. I mean, those those cars are. I've never personally drove one, but if you, I mean, and I've never professionally raced, but I've I've raced enough and been around enough that you start noticing stuff that the average viewer don't notice. Zero to sixty in about two seconds. Zero to a hundred to zero and four and a half or five. And they'll pull several G's in the corner. Mm -hmm. Two and a half G's in the corner. Yeah, two and a half, three G's in the um, corner. I mean, they, they are legit. Yeah, it's it, to this day, I mean, other than, and we'll get to it later in my career, when I got in an Indy Lights car, a shifter cart is by far the most physical car I ever I ever yeah. drove. I mean, yeah. five laps in a shifter cart's 10 times worse than 50 laps in a sprint car. Yeah as far as yeah as, i just don't want everybody work. everybody just kind of glances over the go-kart version and then shifter cart kind of falls into the go-kart thing mm -hmm. but uh i don't think a lot of people actually know how legit of racing that truly is yeah it is um so at the time uh there was a group called scusa uh, shifter carts usa and karting in the united states has always been very fragmented i think that's part of maybe why we struggle to turn out the quality of racers sometimes that come out of Europe because in Europe there's not very many classes at all so right. everybody's lumped together and if you rise to the top like you rose to the top here in the states it's a little bit more like yeah everybody's got their own flavor that they want to do or their own budget so we want to have a class that we can afford to win right and then you end up with these little pockets here and there and there's no way for those pockets to compete with each Correct. other because they're right. so they're yeah. so different i've won 474 feature races and you know raced against a grand total of eight guys <laughs> yeah um so scusa kind of at that point in time had everybody consolidated which was cool because I, I look at the group of people that we raced with and I mean Scott Speed went to Formula One, Almondinger's still running NASCAR, Michael McDowell won the Daytona 500. Um, He's all people you race with in kart. Yeah we were all racing we were all racing in the same class at the same tracks I mean it was of say 50 of us I'll bet 40 of us went on beyond go-karts to race something, and I would say probably every bit of 25 of us got pretty far along, either yeah. to the top to to the top of the category. Of the class. Or, yeah. I mean, and it was it was competitive. Charlie Kimball was there. Um, Hinchcliffe was a junior. Uh, it was it was pretty stout, and um, so we went out and we got our butts kicked. Um, which is what happens when you step out into right. a, new, a new national class. level competition. Um, there's a little bit of technical reason why racing at those races was different than racing at regional or local stuff as far as the way the racetrack developed and the amount of rubber and the whole way you set the go-kart up kind of was opposite. You know, you're running a track that's dirty and cold and green up in the mountains somewhere versus a national where you got a couple inches of rubber build up if you at the at the local race you're trying to find grip and at the national race you can't get rid of enough grip right um <clears throat> so we got through our first year and kind of got to the place where we were able to we were able to hang around like 10th to 15th by the end of the year i mean start of the year we weren't even making finals um and we went to dinner with a guy who was building engines for for one of the guys that was pretty successful because we thought our engine program needed some work and talked to him and that was what basically what what i thought was the dinner conversation that was going to lead to the next thing was actually kind of the thing that ended the shifter cart deal because 
he looked at us and was like, yeah, engines aren't your problem. You know, how much are you testing? And I'm like, ah, oh, we, 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 we race and we do a little bit of testing. He's like, yeah, no, but really, like how many sets of tires did you guys bring up here for this race? And I thought we were doing good. He's like, man, we brought 10 sets of tires. He's like, no. He goes, look, man, he goes, the, the guy that I'm building engines for that's successful has got a $400,000 budget. Oh, And cow. it was like, oh. So <laughs> that's the difference between 10th to 15th and 1st to 5th. Yeah. Is the, that, last, no that last little bit comes with a lot of time and dollars. Time and Extra ultimately zeros. dollars. Yeah. yeah. So my dad was like, wow, we can't do this. And so we talked about it. And neither one of us really saw a point in running the national go kart thing just to run it. Because um, we were spending probably more than we should have. Uh, but we were not able to spend any So were you family to. sponsored at this point or did you have some sponsorship or um, both? Primarily family sponsored. Um, we had, I, at 16, I got a job at a cart shop because I didn't really want to make tacos and burritos anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so the shop helped us out a little bit. Um, it wasn't money. It was mostly just letting us buy stuff at their cost. Right. Um, Supplies. So, so we had a little bit of help, but for the most part, the reality of, of motorsports is through the junior categories of anything, you're going to have to figure out how to make it go. Right. Um, there's just not, there's not, not everybody has there. the uh, Tony Stewart Dairy Queen story. Correct. Correct. Um, and I would be curious to know, the rest of the Tony Stewart yeah. Dairy Queen story. Um, but anyway, so kind of thought that was the end of the road for me. And some guys that my dad knew from sprint car racing said, hey, come check this mini sprint thing that we're doing out. And we went down to their garage and, and saw the car and everything. And they're basically like a, like a small sprint car um, they run like midget wheels and tires and they have like a 1200 cc motorcycle motor in them. And, and for me, I was like, man, this is cool. You yeah. know, this is a race car, oh, not yeah, a go-kart, yeah, right? Yeah. And at the same time, both my dad and I are looking going, well, shoot, if we can't afford to race go-karts, we can't afford to do this. Right. And they're like, no, no, man. Like you guys have, you guys been doing something silly for a while. Like this is really a lot more economical than you think. So we sold all of our go-kart stuff found a guy that was selling a mini sprint operation out, bought the entire operation off of him. It was a sellout deal. So we got a car and everything to run that car and it had a spare motor and pretty much spares of everything else. So it was a pretty turnkey operation and, uh, and decided we were going to try to try to do the mini sprint. thing. Now, how much dirt had your dad raced at this point? Uh, quite a bit, quite a bit. So, um, so he had some, he was familiar with dirt. Track yeah, racing. no, he was he was a sprint car racer, so he ran Pikes Peak, but that's once a year. Right. And there was a, a local guy that he drove sprint cars for, and right. um, so he was racing sprint cars before I came. And so this wasn't like a whole new Ford world. No, team, no, he was, and he and he was still racing sprint cars like the whole way up through there. And through, this was just a new version of dirt car. You. Yeah, right. So, um, so we got going in the mini sprint deal, and. Uh, funny how different things kind of tie together. So my dad crashed a sprint car down in New Mexico while I was off at a mini sprint race with somebody else helping in another place and they needed a wing and the guys parked next to him in New Mexico happened to be a very prominent car owner in the Denver area. And he said, Hey, we got a wing. We'll sell you guys, you know, and I was the one that got tasked with going to pick it up. <laughs> so, um, so I drove up to this guy's shop. The owner was a guy named Harry Conklin and he owned race cars in the Denver area, I think starting in the fifties. Um, and they were always the best stuff, you know, growing up, you're like, oh man, that's, that's the car you want to be in. And so I got to the shop and, and met their mechanic, a guy named Mark Mateka. And like any young race car driver, I look around the shop and see a bunch of stuff and asked for a ride <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of laughed and was like, ah, I don't think that's going to happen. He's like, but you know, if you want to start learning about sprint cars and midgets, he's like, you can come help when you're not racing your own car. Yeah, and so right. that was, that was a relationship that proved to be really pivotal. Um, not just 
what I learned, but just um, getting the connections, getting the connections, getting around people that knew how to do it right. Um, and so as I got kept going in the mini sprint and we were doing all right, Mark would come watch me race when they weren't racing. And he was complimentary and I was asking for a ride and he was still like, no, <laughs> you got to understand, like we get four or five guys that have won a bunch of races in these things calling every week, wanting to know if they can drive one of these things. And I yeah. have to tell them, no, he goes, I'm going to have a hard time justifying why I stick some kid that's never even started one in to the guy that pays the bills. And that was kind of discouraging, but we got to the end of the year and didn't know what we were going to do. And Mark said, Hey, you know, would you want to sell your mini sprint and put a sprint car together? And I was like, well, yeah, I just don't really know that those two things add up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, I found a guy that'd buy your mini sprint. So we sold the mini sprint to that guy and Basically, they went down and dug a bunch of stuff up and put a sprint car together and said, here, you've been helping us all summer. And so technically, it wasn't one of their owned cars, but it was a car they helped you put together. Well, it was one of their cars. It was yeah. one of their older cars that they were, you know, cycling out or whatever. Right. Um, I found out later it was a it was an ex Steve Kinzer car. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, we took that car home and kind of had the gift, right? Like can't afford to put one of these things together ourselves, but found a way to fall into it. And so, so as, long, it out. as long as we've got this stuff, I guess we've got a chance to race. And so in 2003, um, we started racing 360 sprint cars. Uh, there was a track in Denver that ran a little bit, and then there was a pretty strong uh, regional tour that ran kind of Colorado, Wyoming, South Dakota, New Mexico, Kansas, and toured around there um so we we traveled with that and got through our first year in sprint car racing question for you you've mentioned 410 sprint cars and 360 sprint cars can you yeah you so that's what we got chris here yeah, can you dumb me that down for um 410 and 360 is in reference to the number of cubic inches okay um so obviously 410 cubic inches okay. for a 410 car 410 car has aluminum heads aluminum block uh, 360s were started as a more economical way to race sprint cars to kind of open the door for guys that couldn't really afford to be competitive in the 410s. The 410s. Um, so it's cast iron block and they have a spec <coughs> aluminum head. Okay. Well, pretty much, I know there's a little subtle differences, but the, the main difference is just the engine. Just, just the engine. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Cars are, cars are exactly the same. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, and then. I mean, roughly horsepower difference between the two. 360s are in the 650 to 700 range, probably, in all honesty. I mean, you hear people talk dyno numbers, but that gets a little inflated. And a 410 is 850 to 900 horsepower, but I think that the bigger difference than the power is the fact that the 410 car has that aluminum block and is 100 pounds lighter. Wow. So you've got something that so makes your horsepower to weight more ratio. horsepower and weighs less and that combination of things makes them dangerous. pretty different. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can... I mean, they're visually quite a bit different on track, especially on a bigger track. If you see them at the same track on the same night, absolutely. The layperson, if you just went to a 360 race, like if you're in the central states where they don't really race 410s and there's a 360 race, buy a ticket, you'll still see a heck of a show. Okay. Yeah. Um, I noticed that, that when we went to Knoxville with you that one time, they were racing 360s yeah. and 410s back to back. And that's Knoxville, when you notice it. And Knoxville is a pretty good, pretty sizable track. What is it, half mile? Half mile on the inside, I'd say. And... Um, that's whenever I really, the, the, the difference was very, very Same noticeable. Difference. I've heard the numbers, people talk about sprint cars, different numbers. I didn't know what the yeah. actual difference was. And then, I mean, not to get in, we're kind of talking about, but you take the wing off a sprint car and now you got to. Just slides forever. Dart without feathers. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But it's the same. Uh, I mean, that's a. I guess USAC. I mean, that, that car is used for. Like that that car is used for a lot of different okay. forms of racing. Yeah, there are some nuances between a wing sprint car and a non-wing sprint car, but 
for all intents and purposes, they're they're pretty pretty much the same yeah. car. Um, but yeah, so we we ran sprint cars that first year and and won the rookie of the year for the series, and that was kind of cool. For you know, it's about as best you can hope mm -hmm. to do when you're a neophyte. Um, and got to the end of that season, so we went again in '04, and kind of the next odd critical moment happened later that summer. We were getting pretty fast um, and we blew up our motor in Dodge City, Kansas. And I knew that that was kind of the one thing that would put us out of business. That is by far the most expensive part of a sprint car. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's absolutely. the heart and soul of everything. Cars, cars, are, cars are fairly inexpensive, motors are not. Yep. Um, so we could tell that we had had a fairly catastrophic failure before it got to the pits. <laughs> and so- it had an inspection window? <laughs> it, it, had, it, had a view, it had a viewing port. Yeah, those and, are my favorite. Uh, it, it locked up hard enough, it tore the drive line out of it. So that's also a pretty good indication that you've, you've crashed it pretty good. Yep. Um, but anyway, so we get back to the pits and dad and I are kind of sitting there staring at our feet like, well, I guess- I guess we go home now. And the guy parked next to us uh, owned cars and he came over and he goes, well, what are you going to do? I was like, go home. <laughs> He's like, well, I know now you're going to go home, but, but what about next week? What are you going to do? I was like, there is no next week. Yeah. He's like, well, what do you mean? I was like, well, we, we're done. Like we don't have another engine and can't really afford to build another engine. And this one's, uh, one piece the one. This one's run its last race, probably. <laughs> and he's like, well, you can't do that. And it's like, well, I don't know what else <coughs> I can do, you know? Like, it, it is what it is. And he said, well, I got an engine you can run. And I said, well, yeah, but I, I can't afford my own engine. Like, I don't want to take yours. Then I, what, if, what if it breaks? Then I'm going to be two in the hole and one of them yeah. is to somebody <laughs> yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he said, well, you know, I... It blow like you with semi trucks. Yeah, yeah. That's he goes, it it blow up if I was running it, and he goes, so I didn't figure that you'd be able to pay for it. That's why I offered to let you use it. And I was like, really, you do that? And he said, yeah. And so we we got that engine together and finished the year out and got wasn't wasn't a great engine. I mean, I don't want to. No, but it kept you going. Kept us right. going. So at the end of the year, but that's was, uh, I think that also kind of speaks to the. Uh, family atmosphere of the race well the as mm -hmm. much as you guys go at it on track and you know the tempers that flare on tv sometimes once the dust settles everybody realizes if you don't have somebody next to you to race there ain't no point of you being there yeah. either yeah now, it is a dysfunctional family for sure yeah um at this point like are you guys doing the engine work yourselves you no, the guy that built the motors for my dad on Pikes Peak was was doing our engine work. Okay. He was in Colorado Springs and was a drag racer. And mm -hmm. I mean, they, he was he was a competent engine builder. Yeah. Um, I was just curious because I've built engines for people and I know the the price difference of you doing the work versus someone else doing the work. Um. So yeah, we got to the end of the year and said, "Hey, we'll bring your motor back." And he said, "Well, what are you going to race next year?" I was like, "Well." I don't know. He said, well, why don't you keep it and race again next year? So, um, Oh five started and we knew we could kind of have a pretty limited budget for the year. And my dad said, we could probably do about 10 races. He goes, what do you want to do? You want to spread your dad still racing at this time? Well, my dad in Oh three, that's a good story actually. So in Oh three, my dad was still racing sprint cars for another guy. And so basically was, he didn't have an operation. He was a hired driver. He was a hired driver. And then I was driving our family operation and we got to race each other one time. Really? And, uh, we, we ended up in the same heat race and my dad drew the pole and I was inside row two, starting right behind him. And the guy he drove for, didn't have a real strong engine, but it took off good. And our engine was pretty strong once she got going, but it wasn't real quick to want to take off. And so we're coming down to start this heat race at like a snail's pace. And I'm hammering his back bumper like, come on, dad, pick it up, man. You're going to get me buried here. And he knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> So insider information here. So dad wins the heat race and I think I ended up like third. 
Um, Cause I kind of got swallowed up by a couple guys from the slow start and got back to the pits and I was pissed. <laughs> I was not a happy camper. And so I'm yelling at my dad, why would you do that? I can't believe. And he's like, well, ah, you grow up and learn to race like this. <laughs> I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> And my mom is witnessing this whole thing. And so that was, she put the kibosh. She said, look, we're only, we're only going to have one dodge at any one race. So Dick, <laughs> if, if Jeff's racing, you're not. And Jeff, if he's racing, you're not. So that was the only time I got to race my the dad. The funny part is his dad may not be on the track nowadays, but he's still that way on the track today. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I got the last laugh in that deal though, because the next year I, I kind of stole his ride. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, but yeah, I drove that car a couple times and, and, uh, that was another kind of interesting dinner table conversation when dad called the car owner to see where they were, if they were going to go race that weekend. He goes, eh, I think I'm going to let Jeff drive it. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> um, but, but no, it was good. So. Oh, five. Uh, I guess my, uh, my point of that is, is your dad, I'm assuming had funding. He wasn't, he wasn't out spending a lot of uh, money of his own pocket to race. No. Uh, uh-uh. and so he wasn't, he so wasn't, you weren't trying to fund two racing operations. No, at the same uh-uh. time. no, absolutely not. Um, guy named Jack Hammond, uh, owned the car that he drove and it was not a real high dollar operation, but Jack did his thing and dad showed up and drove and then dad and I did our thing with our car. Right, right. So it, it was, there was two separate entities. Right. Um, so 05 came around, it was like, hey, we can do maybe 10 races. Like, you want to spread them out over the year? Do you want to try to just go to the racetracks we like the most? And I was like, nope, let's go to the first 10 we can go to and see, see what, what happens, happens from there. Um, and so, the guy that had loaned us the engine, uh, he called up one day and said, Hey, there's a race here in Nebraska and I'd like to go. But the guy that he had driving his stuff had another commitment. And he said, you want to bring your car out and, and go run this race? And it was like, yeah, I guess he goes, I'll buy some tires and kind of help pay some, some of the expenses if you want to go, which when you're on a 10 race limited budget. If you got a race that you can get some bills paid, yeah. you, you take that you take opportunity. So we went and ran that race and on the way home, uh, cause my parents didn't go, my dad didn't go for that one. He said, Hey, uh, would you have any interest in moving to North Platte, Nebraska for the summer? And I got a lake house you can live in and you can race out of here and, and Colorado. It's a great place for a lot of things not a great place if you want to be a race car driver. So I knew that I needed to move east. And so I thought, well, North Platte, Nebraska is east of Colorado Springs, Colorado. So um, it's moving the right way. And so I ended up driving his car. Well, uh, Barney Visser would argue your point. Um, I ended up driving his car and uh, he was a a difficult guy to work for. probably had some unmedicated conditions that could make him the most charming, interesting guy one day and just absolutely impossible the next. Next. Um, And he had a lot of different businesses. Uh, He owned a Dodge dealership and he had the Coors distributorship for Western Nebraska. So at 21 years old, I was driving a Coors Light 44, which was kind of cool. Kids thought that was kind of yeah. needed school yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, completely ruined Coors Light for me though. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we raced for him and, and he had a 410 and that was, that's, that was, that's where you made the jump. That was, that was a big bit of why I was really interested in doing that deal. So then it became the whole racing story all over again. Larry, can we go run the 410 this week? Nope, you're not ready. Oh, okay. Hey, Larry, can we go race the 410 this week? Nope, you're not ready. And finally, I guess about midsummer, I think I wore him out or maybe he was just ready to see the big motor run. And uh, we went up to Houston Speedway in Sioux Falls, South Dakota and ran my first 410 sprint car race and realized this is a whole, whole different animal than what yeah, I've done, but been running, yeah. man, I can't wait to do it again. And, uh, a guy that is 
pretty good at Cusett. Uh, his name's Justin Henderson. He now happens to be one of my best friends. Yeah, his dad yeah. uh, was taking care of the car that one of the cars he was driving that year at Knoxville, and they needed to, they had a car for sale, and the guy I was driving for wanted to buy that car, and so they got talking at Cusett's, and once again I got tasked with the here you go get it, and so um, it was a uh, it was pretty hilarious trip. So he had a a cabin chassis truck that they needed to have a beverage distribution box put on uh, for the Coors distributorship. And there's a place called Hackney uh, in Independence, Kansas that builds those beverage boxes. And he said, so you, this is what we're going to do. You're going to drive this truck down to Hackney. And on your way down there, you can stop in a little town called Iola, which is where their race cars live. Check the car out. If it all looks good, write him a check for it. Go on down to Hackney. They're going to put this beverage box on. You might have to stay, you know, four or five hours while they put the beverage box on and then drive back up, take the car apart, load it in all the beverage compartments on the truck. <laughs> And drive, oh, wow. and drive on home. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Just that, a small task. Yeah. That makes sense, no I guess. Deal. But where's the chassis going to go? Because that ain't going to fit in one of these Bikes beverage compartments. Yeah. And he said, ah, oh, just put it on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay. So away we went. And uh, I drove that truck down. Car looked fine. Got to Hackney. And they showed up and they said, wait, this is a Dodge truck. Our box isn't going to fit a Dodge truck. Oh, wow. And I'm like, what do you mean the box isn't going to fit a Dodge truck? And they're like, well, we're going to have to do a bunch of fabrication because the way the bed rails are, like, we can get it done, but, you know, it's probably going to take four days. And I'm like, I came prepared for an overnight trip yeah. and I got nothing. So I was stranded in Independence, Kansas in a motel. Uh, fortunately, the guys at Hackney gave me a ride to the motel so I didn't have to walk. Um, and hung out there while they put that together and then went and picked that car up, but got to kind of be friends with Justin's dad when I was down there. Um, and he, he talked the guy I was driving for into bringing me to Knoxville, which is really? sprint car racing's yeah. kind of Indianapolis motor speedway, okay. if you will. It's, it's the home of the biggest race, biggest sprint car race in the world. And, um, so we went to Knoxville and did okay uh, for my second 410 race. Um, made the show and ran around and didn't crash. And so the Nationals were coming up and we agreed that we'd go try to run the Knoxville Nationals. And so my qualifying night at the Nationals was my fourth night in a 410 car and we made the show. And I don't remember where we finished. I think it was like 15th, 16th, somewhere in there. And it, I guess to back up a little bit, um, IndyCar was looking for a way to bring an American short track kid back to the Speedway. And uh, most of the USAC guys were all trying to go down to Charlotte and race stock cars. And so they thought, well, maybe we can find a wing sprint car kid that wants to be an IndyCar driver. And the guy that wins the Knoxville Nationals is probably already making a pretty good living racing sprint cars, so he's not going to want to do it. Let's give it to the Rookie of the Year. Because that might be a young up-and-coming kid that would still kind of change course of career to well, do it. be flexible on what well, But yeah. still, you know, came into the, the biggest race of the year, knowing what was on the line and, um, and was able to perform. And I never in my wildest dreams would have thought that we would end up being Rookie of the Year of the Nationals because there were guys that had won sprint car races in places like Central Pennsylvania and Ohio and stuff that just never had happened to go to Knoxville for the Nationals. And had a lot more experience. Yeah, a yeah. lot more experience, a lot more qualified. But by the time the dust settled at the 05 Knoxville Nationals, I, I was the Rookie of the Year and had the opportunity to go go run Indy Lights the next year and uh I mean that is that I mean not to discredit sprint car racing but that even in Indy Lights is a national series I mean that's that's a that's a big jump into full like yeah um that's a that's a lot bigger jump than you've ever taken before I don't know um it was it was it was definitely a jump into unknown water yeah. um I was really, really glad I had that go-kart experience when I got the chance to go 
lights racing because yeah, that's a bigger go kart. That was the only that's thing. Big yeah, the only thing that really um, probably gave me any sort of preparation for it. Right. But like the lights car, and it, it was funny because leading up to that, you do a lot of interviews and everything else, and you know, it's like the second step from the top, kind of, you know, nationwide, well, I don't even know what, Xfinity, yeah, Xfinity yeah. Uh, to NASCAR yeah. or... Yeah, it's it's one step away from being right. in Indy. You're running, you're running all the same tracks. The car is designed to be similar. Um, they're not quite as quick, so they'd, they'd run 185, 190 mile an hour laps. Still so quicker sure. than a cup car. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Oh, that's that's fast. That's fast. Substantially yeah. slower than 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 an actual Indy car, um, but I mean they only had like 490 some horsepower, so they'd be like, man, you know, you're getting your the latter series for road racing. You you drive stuff that doesn't have a lot of power. So like, it's all oh, about well, what did you think about the big power of the the Indy Lights car? And it's like, well, compared to a spark car, it feels kind of like a pooch, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh but yeah so september of 05 uh went to chicagoland speedway to do my rookie test um because that was kind of the last hurdle you had to get through was the scholarship said hey you'll get a rookie test was well, that the first time you're on a mile and a half track or a track of that mm -hmm. size yeah i mean that has to be a little bit intimidating it was there was a lot that was intimidating about that but there was also a lot that was really cool um the first i mean thing i'm not I'm just looking at it from my perspective. Like, I'm not a race car driver. I never really ever intended to be. I just like the mechanics of racing. But I feel pretty confident that I could get in some sort of car and you give me enough time training and pointers. Like, on a quarter mile track, I could probably get, I'd feel comfortable getting somewhat close to speed. I don't know if I could ever talk myself to driving into Chicago Land Speedway with my foot on the floor. Well, um, but I've never been in your seat either, so funny, I don't know. The funny thing about that, though, Mike, is that. A quarter mile track, like Bloomington Speedway, yeah. just up the road, a couple hours. No fence. It's small, it's narrow, yeah. and in a 410 wing sprint car, you're probably going to qualify at a 9.7, 9.8. Um, that feels way faster yeah, than, and, and, than and a and light's what, car. Average, average speed's probably around 100? Around 100. Yeah, um, it's it, it feels faster at Bloomington in a 410 wing sprint car than it does doing 190 miles an hour at until Chicago. Until something goes wrong. Until something goes wrong. Because you're on a bigger track. You know. the, the whole, yeah, the whole venue just kind of changes the scope of it. I think that's why I'd never be a good race car driver because I'm too, I, I think too far ahead of myself. That means you guys be think, a decent one. You guys think too much in the moment, like. I'm gonna race the shit out of this guy. I don't care if we both end up in the wall. And after you're on the wall, you're like, that was stupid. That was not a good idea. <laughs> so I, I'll go down the corner and I'm like, man, I want to push this hard, but if I wreck us both, we're out of the race, you know? Like, I, it's not the fear of really so, getting hurt. It's just the, I think I'd be a little more timid than I needed to be because I, I got the bigger picture in mind. I don't know. I can tell you it was a little easier to be gung ho and go for it before I owned the car. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, is that when you moved to Indiana then? Yeah, so I went to Chicago for my rookie test. Uh, it was cool because I found out when I got there that Rick Mears was going to preside over my test. Really? So they're like, well, yeah, this is Rick Mears. Like, I know who you are. <laughs> Flashback to 1988, right? Like, I know exactly who you are. And I know everything about your four Indy 500 wins. And like, you're the rocket. I'm yeah. going to listen and hang on to everything that comes out of your mouth. Um, but we... We got in the lights car and I didn't take any of Rick's advice when it actually came time to do it because he was talking about, you know, work up to speed. You got the whole day here and just take it a little at a time. And there was a bunch of media people there because it was a IndyCar kind of production. Um, and I stalled the car the first time they tried to send me out. So they got me refired and sent me out and I got on the racetrack and kind of fumbled my way through the gearbox and got up to speed a little bit. And when I got to turn three, I realized I had no idea when and how much to, to lift. Yeah. But I knew in the race the day before, because we had, we had gone for the, the race weekend and then my test was on a Monday. So I had gotten to be in engineering meetings and kind of see everything. And I knew they were, they were flat qualifying, wide open, you know, no lift on the throttle. And I knew that I had, there's a, like a vertical piece of metal that runs across the back of the wing called a wicker bill. And yeah. that 
relates to how much downforce and drag the wing creates. So bigger wicker bill, more downforce, more drag. And I knew that I had much bigger wickers on the car when I climbed in for my rookie test than what they qualified with. And so I thought to myself, like, this is going to be easy flat and there's two ways to do it. There's, you know, scare yourself and then spend the rest of the day trying to get yourself to go ahead and do it. Or you take the rip the bandaid off approach and say, I know the car will do it, so I'm going to just do it. And so you come down the front straight away, first time in the car, got the thing in fifth gear, which is kind of your high gear um, when you're running by yourself came through the little tri-oval thing and was headed toward turn one and realized that my right foot was shaking, but I wasn't (laughs) lifting. And my dad was in pit road with the team manager and the team manager was used to dealing with, uh, with the race dad, the overbearing race dad that that's funding this thing. And so he, well, you know, don't get discouraged. It takes guys a little while on these big ovals to kind of get up to speed. And, you know, it'll probably take him a few runs before he gets flat out. My dad goes, it sounds like he was flat right there. And they, they told me to radio in when I was flat, so I came by the pits first time and said, well, that was flat. And they said, well, take a couple more laps. <laughs> and after a couple more laps, they said, bring it in. And it was honestly, it's kind of a days of thunder moment because you come in and they said, well, how, how did you feel? I was like, well, felt felt fine. It felt planted, didn't do anything silly. Felt like maybe it was a little tight in the center because I felt it scrubbing a little. And they're like, yeah, no, we had the car set up to do that. Good, good. Yeah, you know, you're feeling it. Well, let's go ahead and put the qualifying wickers on and turn you loose. (laughs) And so I went back out again in the second session. They came on and they said, hey, man, that was a pretty good lap. Like, that'll put you on the front row for for the race yesterday. Like, we're going to just say you passed and cut you loose to start running changes and testing for the team for the rest of the time they have here. And and that was how it started. Um, So they So could could you drive down into turn one wide open? No. I I mean, I ain't gonna lie, I couldn't do it. The engineers were making fun of me because when they got back, they were sure they were looking at the data and there's a trace of your throttle position. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, it was at a hundred, but it looked like it was (laughs) real jagged. And the engineer goes, uh, hey, was your leg shaking a little bit there? Yeah, yeah, it happens to almost everybody. Your sensor was just scared. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Throttle sensor was shaking a little bit. so they invited that no, I'm just that good. Yeah. <laughs> they invited me to the the IndyCar banquet uh, out in California at the end of the season in 05. And a friend of our family, who's a public relations person in motorsports, said that it would be a very good idea if I was invited to be there. Um, so we went, and I got to the racetrack to kind of hang out and walked into the pits, and they said, "Hey, do you want to race this weekend?" It was like, I brought my helmet and I got in, uh, got in a car that hindsight being 2020, I wish I would have never sat in that car. Um, I didn't know that it was, it had been crashed and and the tub was broken, uh, prior to, prior to my arrival and they didn't catch it. And so I did what I did at the, the, the rookie test. I figured like, man, this stuff's cake compared to sprint car racing. Like I'm going to just get in and mash it. Right. And Where was, you, is this at Milwaukee? Uh, Fontana. Fontana. Um, so you're another big track. Two miler. Went from the yeah. mile and a half to a mile and a half with a lot of banking to a two miler with a little bit less banking yeah. and a lot dirtier. Um, and and for no reason I can explain whatsoever, the car just went down into one and two and spun around, and it was like holy crap. Like you said, it doesn't feel like you're going as fast That's until something happens. Like. Well, when you're sideways at 185 miles an hour, first thing you realize is how hard the thing sets you into the side of the car, and you're like, wow, this is really nuts. And oh, shoot, there's the a wall. Fast. <laughs> there's a wall out there somewhere. Um, and fortunately, I kind of spun down the back stretch so I didn't hit anything and was in the process of trying to clean my shorts out. Uh, <laughs> And this voice comes on the radio because my teammate was Ari Leyendike Jr. And I recognized the voice right off. And he's like, Jeff, this is Ari Leyendike. Uh, what, what happened there? And I'm like, I have no idea. And so we went through the whole weekend and it was, it was the same deal. Like the car would go around pretty good. And then for no reason whatsoever coming off a of turn two, it would just turn itself backwards and you'd go spinning down the back stretch. Um, and so the, did you spin multiple times? Three. Or, 
Three. Three. The third one, I finally hit something. <laughs> and then when they were doing the damage assessment on the car, they said, well, the tubs broke. And so that's what's making it very unpredictable. Yeah, well, but we didn't know that the tub wasn't broke in my crash. So I am absolutely at this point, like zero confidence. Like I have no idea why this car is doing what it's doing. And now I've completely written a car off and it wasn't even that bad a crash. Like, I can't believe you can write one of these things off that easy. And so like I went from here to like the floor. But isn't as, that racing? That is racing. Um, later found out when they were getting ready to take that car because they decided to take it to the University of Nebraska and crash test it um, for some new intrusion panels they were going to put on the cars that the guy that was getting the car ready to go to the sled said, hey, you kind of got a raw deal there. And I said, well, what's that? He goes, well, when the tub breaks, it'll pop the paint. And he goes, look at the paint. So they repainted the car and, and didn't realize that it had broken. So I was ripping around at 185, 190 miles an hour with suspension that wasn't exactly attached properly. Attached properly. <laughs> Structurally sound. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. So that, that led to 06 and we did the oval races, uh, or we're supposed to do the six oval races. We ran Homestead. That seems we've... like that'd be a fun track. Was that was it reconfigured while you were mm -hmm. down there? Yep, yep, it was current configuration. Uh, progressive banking's neat. Yeah. Um, the seams are kind of sketchy. Yeah. You don't want to straddle a seam. You want to pick a lane and be in a lane. Um, but uh, we did Homestead. And then the next oval was Indy. And. Now that's got to be intimidating, turn one in Indy. That is probably the most intimidating corner I've ever. So for people who don't know, you come down the front stretch of Indy, which is the most famous. I mean, mm -hmm. first off, how how cool is it that you're one of the few people that have ran a lap at speed at that? I mean, that's yeah, that's that an elite it. group to run a lap at speed at that track. Um, but you got grandstands on both sides. Mm -hmm. It's a 90 degree turn. 90 degree so corner. So if you come down the one of the longest straightaways in racing. Five eighths of a mile. You're staring at a wall. Yeah, <laughs> and, and yeah. the thing the <laughs> thing that the thing that is tough about turn one at Indy is exactly what you just said. Um, you're visually obscured at the point that you turn in, like you can't see your apex. Right. So as a and, racer- And, and then the, the speed of what you're approaching the corner. You don't have a lot of time. <clears throat> Once again, thankfully Rick came to my rescue and it's like, hey, there's a gate on the outside of the track um, in turn one and that's, that's your turn in point. And it's kind of hard to see a gate on a flat wall when you're running down next to it. So there's a, one of the track lights is about 150 <coughs> feet toward you from the gate. So you can use that light because it's easy to see the light at the end of the straightaway to know that, hey, that's kind of where I need to be putting myself so that when I see that gate come flash into view, roll your hands right in. The so was it, was it Indy or Michigan where he gave you the van ride and scared the crap out of you? Indy was the van ride that scared the crap out of me. Um, <laughs> I think that's worth least mentioning. He was, yeah, so they, they, they asked a group of us, they said, hey, you know, Rick will take you out in the minivan and kind of show you the ropes before you get out here for real. And <laughs> anybody wants to jump in and go, like, go. So I was, I was first guy in the van, I think. And we get out there and Rick's got the thing just pinned and we're coming down <laughs> and see him out there in one little Dodge caravan or yeah, whatever it was. He's got the thing pinned and we're all riding down toward turn one with him. And he goes, and he had run a couple laps by then. And he goes, yeah, so the tendency here at Indy is, you know, with the way you can't see into the corner and everything, everybody wants to turn in too soon. And what happens is when you turn in too soon, you get down to the center and you realize, oh shoot, the apex is up there and I'm gonna be coming out toward the wall, so I need to tighten it up. And he like, what? And he goes, so he cranks some wheel into the thing and the freaking van, <laughs> and I'm in the back like, whoa. <laughs> and so as, as, barrel roll down there. <laughs> as he kind of gets it straightened out out of two, he goes, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much what happens. That's, <laughs> and it was like, whoo. <laughs> But uh, I couldn't imagine. We were we were practicing for the race at Indy, and like I knew we had something wrong with our engine, 
And I was complaining about it to the team going, this thing's just slowing down and like, we're not that slow. And they're going, yeah, every race car driver that isn't up to speed wants to complain about the engine. And I'm like, no, I'm telling you something's wrong. And so um, I had had a little experience blowing stuff up by then. And- <laughs> Installing inspection yeah. boards. Right, yeah. yeah. So uh, it blew up in the second practice coming off the one, it dropped the cylinder but obviously it's still running on seven at that point. And I thought to myself, I thought, man, I can't, I can't dump out of the throttle and shut her down just yet or else they might not replace this motor. So I kept my foot in it and then it was running on six and then it was running on five. And that's when I thought, you know, I remember seeing guys blow up here and then dump a bunch of fluid down under the rear tires and then end up in the fence. Like it's probably broke enough that that's good. Yeah. yeah. Not, not. <laughs> Mission accomplished. So I shut her down and coasted into the pits and got on the radio. It was like, hey, it blew up. I'm getting out. And they're like, ah, don't get out. Stay put. We got the engine guys coming down. And it was like, look, man, I can smell coolant. <laughs> I can smell coolant sitting in the car like it's broke. And they got the engine cover off and the engine guys were like, yeah, it's broke. So my... Uh, my volunteer team of mechanics, because it was kind of a low funded Indy Lights program, we didn't have enough money for full time people on that car. Um, they didn't, weren't able to get the engine changed in time to qualify. So we got to start my day at Indy DFL. Um, and it, it was a pretty interesting race, 100 miler, um, starting in the back, you got a lot of dirty air, car wasn't very good. And I got, I got stuck in the car in front of me's kind of jet wash. I got in the bad air behind him and he came out on the exit of one and like dust came up between him and the wall cause he almost got it. And so I knew right then and there I was gonna hit the fans um, because in his dirty air, I'm kind of out of control and you know you're gonna go further than he did and he just about butt bit it. So I smoked the fence coming off of one on lap four and should have ended our day right there um because i knew it was bent since the steering wheel wasn't pointed exactly the same direction anymore um but it wasn't dragging the ground and it wasn't like crashed immediately and so i guess i i just had this kind of feeling that today's probably the only day that i'm ever going to get to be here mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I pull this thing in to have them check it out, they're not going to send me back out to ride around and enjoy the rest of my day at the speedway. I'm going to get to go back to the garage area. So for five eighths of a mile up the back stretch, um, I got to think about what was going to happen in turn three. And <laughs> Which I made, is an eternity, even though you're flying. I made the decision that we were going to go for it. And I, I said a prayer and it was something to the tune of God. I'm going to go for this and I'm going to ask you for one of two things, either let this thing go through turn three and let me finish the day here and kind of have this moment or let me hit hard enough. I don't remember how bad it hurt. <laughs> and so it was a little bit of a wait going down the back stretch to find out which, which of those two options was going to pan out. And I got to turn three and probably could have let go of the wheel and the car just right wow, through there really? and it was like like way better than we had been all week <laughs> <laughs> like way better just need to run the damn thing into a wall <laughs> so um so yeah it uh it didn't crash and all of a sudden everybody in front of me was coming back toward me quite quickly and turn one was difficult that day we had a tailwind up the front stretch so what that means is you get to turn one and your wings are going through the air 10, 12 miles an hour slower than right. your car is traveling on airplane, the track. Airplane airspeed. Airplane airspeed versus, yes, exactly. So Two podcasts ago, we thought I'd have a guilty pleasure of watching aviation videos. Um, a lot of guys were having to lift in one in the race that day. And after I hit the fence, I could drive it all the way down below the white line on the rumble strips. The F1 curbs were a little sketchy. You wanted to stay off the F1 curbs, but I could run the thing down below the white line in turn one, wide ass open, like no big deal. And we were able to start making moves and building runs. 
And then going into three, we had a headwind. So that's the opposite effect. Right. You know, now you got more 200 miles. miles an hour worth of downforce at and less speed. five miles an hour less speed yeah. than I got on the other side. And that was when I, I thought, okay, all these guys are blocking the bottom because they don't want to let you get the inside, but I'm a sprint car racer. <laughs> There's two grooves on every racetrack, right? <laughs> and so we started passing people around the outside of turn three and um, we set a race record for most positions advanced and it went green to checker, so it wasn't because they had a big crash. Um, and, uh, and so it was a pretty good day at Indy and everybody was real, real excited. And so the people from Knoxville um, and, and IndyCar, they were all excited and, and we had a, he's dead now, so I feel like I can, I've never really publicly spoken about what happened here, but they, they said, hey, we've got a three year program where every year the rookie of the year is gonna get to come do what you're doing. But like somebody has to make it to the 500 so we can prove that it worked. And, um, and you, had, you had a good day at the Speedway. The Speedway suited you and so. That's we're gonna, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. self-adjusted the car. Yeah. Extend, your, extend your program through the 08 500. And I was like, holy cow. The dream right might happen um little did i know uh about two or three weeks later um somebody decided that they were done writing the checks and so that whole program kind of evaporated overnight and i learned another lesson about big time motorsports which is you're only as good as your money is and yeah. uh and so i was looking for a, a job um, cause when I left Colorado, the deal was like, Hey, you know, uh, if you're going to school and, and studying and getting good grades and you can kind of try to race on the weekends as much as you can with your dad and we'll help you. But if you drop out of school and go do something else, like you gotta be an adult and be on your own. So I had, so literally within like a month, you went from a legitimate chance to make the Indy 500 to. I had a verbal contract for the 08 500 to I will be down at Taco Bell again if I don't find something else to do soon. And I had moved to Indiana. I guess I skipped the part where at the end of yeah. 05 into 06, they said, hey, we want you to take this seriously. Would you move to Indianapolis? And so that's what I did. Um, so now it's probably making more sense why you randomly ended up showing up at my shop one day. Uh, we're, we're a long way from that. <laughs> um, but no, the... After the lights deal evaporated, I, I was like, shoot, I don't want to get a real job. So um, aforementioned friend Justin Henderson was on the road with the World of Outlaws at that point in time. Um, and they were having some personnel challenges with one of the members of their team and it was time to make a change. And so uh, they switched him out for me and I worked on that car for, for the later part of 2006 as a mechanic and figured, hey, this is a, uh, opportunity to travel the country and meet car owners all over the country and right. try to get myself going again. Um, so we did that and then uh, ran my one and only Chili Bowl uh, in 07. We had sponsorship from IndyCar, which was kind of cool. It was number 500 and it was a little bit of a foreshadowing of what was to come in life because I learned that even though Chili Bowl is a really small track, you can crash a midget pretty hard there. <laughs> And you can crash a midget hard enough to end up in the catch fence to tear the caterpillar banner down and wrap it around the car as you're flipping. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's that, one way to try to get caterpillar sponsorship, I guess. When that one when that one came to a stop, I was sitting in the car, kind of loopy, and thinking, "Holy crap! I didn't think that you could crash that hard here. Like that really hurt. Like way worse than a lot of things." And I've got nothing but cat across the <laughs> view out the front, <laughs> which. Uh, which that was somewhat foreshadowing the future, I guess. So, or if people want to go back and watch, I'm assuming they can find this Indy Lights race on YouTube and this Chili Bowl on YouTube. I don't know if the 06 Freedom 100's on YouTube or not. I'm um, sure it is somewhere. It probably is. Uh, I've got the radio broadcast in my iTunes library. Really? Um, and sometimes we'll still listen to it just to kind of remember remember that day yeah. um and uh so it was back sprint car racing i got hooked up with a guy out of Terre Haute 
and started racing non-wing sprint cars in Indiana. Um, we won three races that year and it was toward the end of the year the car owner finally let me put a put a wing on the thing and go run an all-star race at Lawrenceburg and he found out what I'd been telling him all year which is I'm a better wing sprint car racer than non-wing sprint car racer and so that was that was kind of back down the sprint car the wing so sprint car path. So, so basically at this point you're back to being a paid sprint car driver. Yeah I mean paid sprint car driver did I take a percentage of the winnings to pay my rent yes yeah but you weren't but my overhead was pretty low <laughs> <laughs> I mean when you're when you're 23 24 years old and pretending to be a full-time race car driver because you got no responsibilities in life yeah. and you know no bills no family uh, that sort of thing like it, it worked for that but it was it was not going to be something that you could make a career at um so raced along it was it was a hobby that was paying the bills yeah the time. yeah that's a good way to describe it raced along for a few years and uh in 2012 we got going pretty good with the outlaws when they were in our neck of the woods um had a really good showing at paducah kentucky they're going back there next year um I don't think they've been back since that race, actually. Are we going back? Oh, if you bet your butt. If I if 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 we're not there, it is because it is absolutely not feasible to be there. Otherwise, we will be at Paducah for sure. I love that place. It's it's one of my favorite racetracks in the country. Long straightaways, tight corners, really high banked. Um but yeah, we got some momentum going. And at that point, the guy that I was driving for had gotten divorced. And so he had nothing but his race cars and a crappy apartment in Terre Haute. And so he was like, hey, like you gotta find a way to make this thing go without any other money coming in. But as long as you can keep it going, we'll keep racing. And we rode a car off up at I-96 Speedway in Michigan. And I had been talking to a guy in Illinois named Shane Wade, um, who's still a good friend of mine today about maybe running his car at Knoxville for the Nationals that summer because he wanted to go there. And as it would go, we wrote that car off in Michigan and he took his guy, Alex Shanks, down to uh, a 360 race in Mississippi. And unfortunately, Alex had a pretty big crash and a closed head injury when he walked away from there. So he was, he was gonna be done for a while. And so it, Shane and I kind of hooked up and, and went um, for the rest of the summer. And Shane's a younger guy. He was only maybe four or five years older than me, and his operation was growing. And I thought, hey, this is something that you know we can build, we can build around. Um, and it looked like a million bucks. He bought the Lonnie Parsons, who was the Casey's World of Outlaws team, out. So we had all the featherlight truck trailer. He had a big motorhome we traveled in. But um, when I started with him, they had zero cars together and. Right. just kind of a bunch of stuff and so that ended up being not great for my stock price because we didn't run near as well in his car as what, what we you... did in the nothing special right. that we started the year but it looked like a world of outlaws operation so you looked legit just weren't running legit exactly exactly and so that was kind of the last decent opportunity that I had so I raced for another guy in 13 at Knoxville weekly and we just didn't have the smoke uh, to compete there under the hood but we were still going plenty fast enough to hurt yourself but you're back racing with guys that you'd rather not be racing with at those kind of speeds and so there was a, a pretty big crash that I really should have been the guy doing the crashing but I there was a guy pretty indecisive about which direction he wanted to go and I guessed he was going to go one way and I went the opposite way and then he ended up going my way so I got all checked up and another guy was sailing around both of us and then that guy bounced the guy that was indecisive bounced off the infield berm and cleans the guy that was blowing around the outside of both of us out and I don't think I've ever seen a race car go that high before and I was looking at the arc of his trajectory and thought oh man if I stay wide open, I'm pretty sure I'll be like side by side with him when he hits. But if I try to like get on the brakes and check up, 
I'll be behind him when he hits. And the problem when a sprint car is flying through the air, flipping and gyrating and doing everything else and comes down and hits, it's kind of like a football. I don't know which way you have no idea which way it's going to go. Yeah. So I elected to, to just leg it and say, hey, I'll, I'll race you to the point of impact so that I don't end up killing you if you bounce out in front of me. And it hit just outside the right side of the car. And it was the loudest, I mean, loudest hit I've ever heard. And then immediately after that, I realized that I needed to avoid the ambulance that was coming out of the infield against traffic. And part of his car had gotten flung over the fence into the grandstands. Fortunately, it was a weekly show and you've been to Knoxville at a weekly show. Those are big, big grandstands. So yeah. most everybody sits up toward the top and the bottom rows are all completely empty. Well, there was a lady sitting in the bottom row, fortunately saw the whole front end of the car coming toward her. And so she, took off to try to get out of the way and tripped and fell down the grandstands, which was better than not doing anything because the front end smashed along the grandstands and would have killed her for sure. But when she fell down the <laughs> grandstands, she broke her leg. And so the, the, the medical team had seen the part go into the stands and they weren't sure if it hit the lady. So they were coming to the fastest way to get there, which was through the gate where the flag flagman gets back and forth. And, uh, and so that was kind of a long drive home on Sunday where you go, that really should have been me. And he was in pretty bad shape. He never raced again. The guy that was in the crash uh, that I know <coughs> of. And I just kind of was like, you know what? I've, I've, it's 2013. I've been doing this since 2003. And you were pretty fortunate. You didn't, I mean, you had some bang ups here and there, but you never really had any major, major yeah, I know. Don't even say it. We'll move on. Because <laughs> um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking this year you were right next to another one because Gunner saw you on TV in Charlotte. Oh, yeah, that was a scary crash in Charlotte. Um, that was, I mean, that was a viral crash here. What two months ago? Yeah, and that was, the cars, that was big. the cars that bouncing was off big. the catch fence, going every which way, and here comes Jeff Dodge rolling into the TV screen. Yeah, yeah, that was big. That was an interesting one, just from kind of like. Uh, I'm, I can't. Uh, what was his? Zeb uh, Wise. Zeb, yeah, Zeb. He's all right. He's gonna. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The outcomes completely different. Outcomes, right? outcomes different. But yeah, it was a scary, scary crash. It didn't look scary when I passed it, because like it looked like just kind of a normal two guys go up and hit the fence, and then the red lights come on, and you think like, yeah, okay, somebody tipped over, no big deal. Yeah. And then they come on the radio and said, hey, it's going to be a long red. We're going to push you all around to the backstretch. And I thought, oh, that ain't good. That's usually when they're like working on getting somebody out or got to fix the yeah. fence. And so they pushed us around and I looked over and you couldn't see the car. They just had two or three ambulances and stuff down there. And my first thought was like, what the heck are they doing down in like turn four? <laughs> yeah, because you like, did the This right. started back in turn three. And then I saw the video of it and was just kind of like, yeah. man, that's legit. But anyway back to 13 i i was thinking about the risk and the fact that i knew when i got in the car that night we had no shot at winning for us a win was going to be to put it in the show and advance our position after the start because we couldn't qualify right you know we didn't have the horsepower to qualify and later in the night it's not so much about horsepower so you could try to race but um I just thought to myself, I was like, you know, I got a lot of life ahead of me and uh, that guy's going to have some challenges for at least the foreseeable future. And if that was me, I'm not real sure that I wouldn't have regrets going forward that I right. chose to be here. And so uh, that was when I decided to to step away from the sport until I had an opportunity that was at least capable of winning. So this is where you, you're still based out of Indy at this time. Mm -hmm. Yep, never left Indy. And um, this is where the, uh, the excavating business comes into play. I know you did a few other things. It's a little, a little early, so I first got a sales job because I needed to pay my bills and had been doing that job in 13 a little bit anyway. Um, but uh, knew I wanted to do something other than that and had a friend that was flipping houses. 
and people were wanting him to take on some kitchens and bathrooms, that sort of thing. And he said, hey, you know, I've got some, got some work and I don't have anybody to help. Um, you want to give this a go? And it was like, might as well right and so we started uh started a whole lot of experience outside of racing at this point no um i had i had grown up in a horse family um so like my grandpa had horses and for a while my mom had horses and um so you know how being around horses are there's always something that needs to be done yeah, yeah. and from a fairly young age i was the designated skid steer operator so i had had <laughs> another manure, re or manure relocator mm -hmm. manure relocator sand spreader you know road yeah. grader whatever needed done um so i had had some experience on on a skid steer and my buddy that was flipping houses had a backyard on one of his flips that needed some work done and i was getting kind of tired of that dead end sales job and so I asked him, I said, well, what are you going to do with the backyard? And he said, well, I got a bid from a guy to come in and clear all the overgrowth out and tear the old garage foundation out. And we're going to put in gravel parking area. And I said, well, what's he going to charge you for that? And he said, well, 3000 bucks. And I said, well, hey, if I told you I could do it for less, would you let me do it? And made some phone calls and kind of put together a price to rent a skid steer and hire some trucking and go do that job for him. And I did, and at the end of it, he said, hey, man, I, I really don't care how much you made because you saved me 500 bucks, um, but how much did you make? And I was like, eh, I made 1,000 bucks. And he was like, really? And I said, yeah, he goes, we need to do this every day. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'd love to. I just don't know where we're going to find work. But that was kind of, I think, what showed him that I was capable of getting a job done. And so we partnered up and started doing some kitchens and baths and um and then started getting phone calls to hey can you come replace a sewer line or can you do this or that and it was always like no 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 um but uh one of the flips that he had sold um he made a mistake and it, it was an honest mistake in terms of the disclosure when he listed it because you got to say whether the basement was wet or dry and he's midway through this project things got no gutters on it it's got no downspouts on it you know I'm sure there's a lot of stuff i also like to say right now i can't but grading's messed up and so the basement was not dry but he was like i've been through enough construction projects that i know when we get the house done and get the grading right and get the roof on it and get the downspouts on like it'll be dry so yeah no it's got a dry basement well, it wasn't. So the buyer that Buy bought it were a young couple, and the wife was a paralegal. Oh, lovely. And so, <laughs> and so she had their attorney um, send us a nice letter uh, along with an estimate from an interior waterproofing company for $22,000 and kindly let us know that we needed to pay for that to be remedied and for us at that point as business it was like shoot that's that's curtain this is this is a blown up motor all over again, right? <laughs> yeah. um and so i started doing a little research and i'm like man this interior waterproofing company wants twenty two thousand dollars to do this and i don't even know if that's the right way to fix it like you look at how they do all this stuff now and you know they, they got membrane board on the walls and they got exterior drainage and like we can fix this for less than $22,000. Certainly they can't drag us to court and like force us to come off of the cash if we answer on the other end like, yeah, sorry about that, we'll come fix it. And so I started doing some more research and it was, and like I, I knew about renting equipment, so it was like, well, if we rent equipment by the day, you rent three days and they'll let you keep it a week. You rent three weeks and they'll let you keep it a month. So maybe we got this little problem we got to work our way out of. Maybe if I can hustle up out of some of these other phone calls that we usually say no to, if I can hustle up a couple more jobs, we'll just go rent a mini excavator and a skid loader for a month and take care of problem A and take care of, take care of the problem and then get some other stuff done. And so we were able to do that and we thought, yeah, we'll just try this for a month and see how it goes. We didn't make any money. Um, we actually probably made more money doing what we were doing before. 
but I had fun. Yeah. And you could see pretty early on that, hey, when we get good at this and when we don't have these big rental bills and stuff like that for these jobs, like we could probably do better at this than, than doing bathrooms. The potential is there. So we, we split the company. Um, end of that year, we kind of, because I had no credit whatsoever. I didn't have bad credit, but as a racer that was trying to be a racer, I never knew how much I was going to make, when I was going to make. And the one thing I knew for sure was I didn't have any sort of job security or consistency. Like it was week to week. Um, and so I never borrowed money for anything. So I had never really established credit. And so I had gone down to the cat dealership and said, hey, you guys rent equipment and you sell equipment. Was there any chance if I rent equipment from you guys exclusively that Cat Financial would be willing to look at that as credit history? Because if you look up my credit history, you're not gonna find anything. And they said, well, let us call Nashville and we'll let you know. And they called back and said, yeah, they, they said they'd do something like that. So by the end of that first year, we had done that month long deal and then a few other one-off jobs and had racked up a decent amount of rental bills and my partner and I sat down and it was like well we're probably not going to do less of this the following year than we did the year before and it looks like we already spent enough money renting stuff that we probably could have made the payment on this machine all year long so let's just go ahead and buy one and so I was laughing on the the last episode when you said, well, you know, maybe you start off with a mini excavator and a <laughs> pickup truck and a dump trailer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right here. Um, yeah. And so that's what we did. And um, we split the company because we also knew that it was a little bit risky doing the excavating work. And I had managed to get myself in a bit of a bad situation in a trench collapse and was like, well, you know, if we kill somebody, we don't want to take the other the other half of this business that goes back out. to the rest of the other half of that uh, conversation with putting firewalls between everything yep. yep so we split it up we had two separate llc's and lamb excavating and lamb contracting were two entities doing two things my partner ran the contracting one and i ran the excavating company and we started to get a lot of work um and we were doing work for indiana's largest home builder and i was swamped and needed people and we couldn't find any people and so at that point in time we thought well we've got a couple guys working on the contracting side of things that at least show up to work and are decent to be around all day and try hard so maybe we need to teach the rest of us to dig and so we kind of closed down lamb contracting and put all of our eggs into the excavating basket and there's so many similarities between that and kind of my path with the contracting yeah. and I'd like to go back to the, the statement about the guy who would have some other comments too and say that that guy didn't lie on the seller's disclosure. <laughs> oh, I agree 100%. It's a little, it's different, but the same. It's the same concept, or it's the same topic, but it's a completely different situation. Yeah. That guy will tell the story about it in like two weeks. <laughs> I'm looking forward to having that guy on the podcast. Me too. He's got a lot to say. Sorry. Um, Jeff has no idea what we're talking yeah, about. I'll fill you now. in later about that guy. Um, so yeah, that, uh, that's how we found ourselves in the excavating business and, uh, it took six years, but, uh, well, six years from when we started the construction company till full on excavating. Well, no, it, it took, I guess it was the second summer that we started, that we did the rental summer. And then it was the third summer or the third, third spring we bought our first machine. And then I guess three years of excavating and it was back to I think I think I have enough money I can put a race car together well that's gonna be my next question is how did we come back full circle to racing well I mean I'm not gonna lie uh, the reason I stayed in Indiana instead of going back home to go work with my dad which is kind of what I always thought my plan B would be he's a financial guy um, manages people's money and uh, has to stay plugged into the 24 hour news cycle all the time, which is not a good thing for me. I get a little bit too wrapped up in things I have zero control over. You and, too got that in uh, it's better for me to just kind of be a, put my head in the sand a little bit and then yeah. worry about stuff that you got to use the industrial of. tinfoil on the hat because <laughs> right. then it doesn't get through as quick. Right. <laughs> Trust so, me. 
and I wanted to race. And so I'm looking at these two things going, I don't think I'm going to have a very happy life doing what my dad does. And if I go home and do what my dad does, then I've literally gone west when the whole time in my career, I knew if I wanted to race, I needed to go east. east. So it was like, do I want to go home and have a head start in business and get to go to work with my dad and not do what I love to do anymore? Because I've gone this far, there'd be no reason to race any of the stuff in Colorado again, because that'd be like 10 steps backwards and just in my mind, a waste of money or I got to stay here in Indiana and I had never found my own sponsorship. Like that's one thing I wish I would have learned much younger in my career was how to advocate for myself, sell myself. Because all these teams you raised for had their team sponsors or were self-funded. Self. With the exception of the lights program, most of the guys were self-funded. Yeah. Um, you know, we had sponsors because their business is on the side of the right, car. Right, yeah. right, right. Um, and Which so, was there for other reasons possibly than providing money to the, uh, to the, we're yeah, going to get into the whole tax conversation again. But, yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, I thought to myself like, ah, I've never really felt comfortable trying to solicit money for my racing efforts because I don't know how to do that. So maybe rather than trying to beat my head against the wall to raise money to go racing, maybe I'll just build myself a sponsor as a business instead of instead of try to find somebody else to sponsor me. Um, and so that's that was always the plan was to get a business rolling and to no longer have to deal with the whims of car owners where you come and you work your butt off on their equipment and you try to start to get it built into something, get it all organized, get it put together right. And then, you know, it's the nature of racing. If, if you're not bringing skin to the game, the easiest thing to change is the seat. And yeah. in my case, there was a guy that was bringing a little bit of sponsorship to the, the owner and had been around the sport longer and traveled with the outlaws and stuff and so when he came looking for a ride and i had kind of a rough end of the season we ended up going three for three for crashes in the last three races of the year it's like you can't really blame the owner that much for saying hey let's just try something yeah. else and hey jeff sorry about you You're i mean at the, end of the day racing's a business too i mean yeah. you gotta make decisions to keep keep it going so it, after all of that i was just kind of like you know what I'd really like to have my own stuff because I'll never get that phone call of, hey, you're not racing tomorrow. I really appreciate everything you've done for us, but we're gonna we're gonna go a different direction. Yeah. Well, and I don't want to get too far ahead of it, but it, it also gives you the chance to give other people opportunities in the future, possibly. I hope so. Um, I learned in the six-year period when I wasn't racing that you still love racing. I need to be racing. Yeah. Like I am, I am happiest when I'm racing. Um, even with the risk, even with the risk. And the other thing I've learned, I think over the last three years of this racing project, cause you know, it's been no cakewalk and it hasn't been, frankly, it hasn't been nearly as successful as it was early in my career. As far as on track results, um, you start to have doubts and start to ask yourself like, well, you know, maybe at 40, I don't have it anymore or maybe the sports kind of passed me by, or, you know, maybe whatever, you know, what do I want to do? Do I want to sell this stuff? And I decided, no, I'm going to keep call somebody forward. else up and we'll change the seat and I'll, I'll keep building race cars and keep doing what we're doing. Um, but yeah, so it was time to put a race car together and uh, through, I think it was LinkedIn or Facebook or something. There was a guy who's kind of a sponsor hunter, um, mostly worked in the professional off-road arena in his, in his actual career. And he had retired professionally and was putting these seminars on trying to help racers learn what you got to do to raise money. And I was pretty skeptical of it but i was like you know what maybe i'll maybe i'll jump on this zoom call and just see what this is all about and it was cool 
and I learned some things and so I started doing these zoom calls and like he was really gracious and didn't charge me anything he was just like hey come come check this out and uh, the thing that became apparent real quick is that today corporations really 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 want that social following and in my six-year period of no racing, my entire social media was all people that knew me because of my racing. Right. And I didn't know most of them, but there was also a lot of other racers and stuff on there. So my entire feed was nothing but motorsports, right? And like that's the one thing I want to be doing, and I'm not doing. So I did. In your face. I did the dumb thing, and I deleted all of it. Just <laughs> 86. <laughs> And so I'm sitting in this seminar and I'm going, holy cow, man, that was dumb. Cause I had thousands of people that were already following me and I threw yeah. all that away. Um, and now I got to start from scratch and that's all these people seem to care about. And that was when I was like, hmm, are those go-kart tires? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's when I got a phone call. That's when you got a phone call. So or I think we've come full text. circle on this one now, huh? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I guess, I guess back to my point of the story, I remember if you called, I'd just tell by the way you approached it, you weren't a complete idiot. Well, I, I don't think it hurt because if I recall in my very first email, I said, the one thing I'm not going to ask you for is money. Yeah, I think you did say that. I did. Cause I figured, you know what, if I reach out and say I'm a racer, the first thing this guy's going to think is, yeah. oh great, here comes somebody and else I wanting think, money. You know, um, the one thing that I think. I don't know if we ever even discussed this, but the one thing I wasn't after was huge recognition on what you did. Like, I fully knew I was going to be a small part of whatever you did. I never expected a damn car to be a dirt perfect car. You know what I mean? I just, I was happy to, I was, I was appreciative just to be a small part of it. Well, and, then and, some way, and to, be, to be honest with you, I believe, I got to remember back that far. Um, I think you were the first person to actually funny. I said, the only thing I'm not going to ask for is money. And then the first thing you did was hand me, hand me some money, which was all <laughs> <Yeah>. nice. <laughs> this is true. But so. I think you were the first, the first, uh, the first investor in Jeff Dodge racing. First, well, first legitimate partner. Whenever you make it big time and you win this, uh, get a charter for the high limit system. Don't forget, don't forget me. <laughs> oh, I don't think we'll forget you, Michael. Yeah. I don't think we'll forget you because I'm not sure Gunner would let it happen. No, yeah. Gunner won't let it happen. And Aaron's a, more of a fanboy than anybody. But uh, no, I mean, you come down. We, of course, keep in mind this was three over three years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't near where I'm at now. Um, so you were already pretty, I mean, I don't know, you'd know more than I do, but just from, from my perspective, and I don't follow your channel and some of the others near as close as, as your followers probably right. do. Um, but I think you guys have all grown a lot oh, since yeah. that three years ago. So like, I don't. I mean, I, I don't know where you've gone kind of in the relative ranking of things, but I would say um, reality excavating YouTube channels as a whole have grown. Yeah, um, yeah, there's you know, more, more, more people in there. But I mean, from my perspective, I, it was it was a cool and an honor to even be asked to be part of it. Yeah, and it was it was super neat. Um, the first time we unloaded the car with your name on it first thing that happens is some guy walks down and asks his mic there yeah and then <laughs> just thinking are you kidding me right now <laughs> you posted a video i think that day um from when you guys came up to circle city that first time and uh you know and there were people in the comments you know oh yeah he won an all-star heat race last night and stuff and that's when i was kind of like wow that's interesting like our our demographic overlaps yeah. a lot more than i would have ever thought absolutely um, yeah yeah, it definitely has. I mean, it's been, uh, I know you haven't had the success uh, with the race team that you hope to have. Yet. But, yet, I agree. And that might be the reason why there hasn't been any videos of racing. That's this all right. Year. We'll, we'll wait till we have some good ones. We, we've, we've started two or three videos that ended in not good scenarios, but. Uh, <laughs> Gunner's got a wing panel above his head, <laughs> this though. This true. Gunner's got some new home decor. <laughs> but. Like I said before, just being there, <clears throat> having an excuse to be there at the race, being there, being invested with somebody at the race, 
And uh, the last race I think we did with you was uh, Kokomo, the high limits race. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just, I, I just think back about the experience Gunner had. He was literally pitted one car away from Kyle Larson. Jason Peck that won the race was two cars down. Mm -hmm. You know, huge crowds at both trailers. We're in the middle of them. I mean, probably 15, 20 people picked me out of the crowd up there. Um, and those kids thought they were at the damn Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Like they, they think Jeff is up here with these guys, which I'm not saying you're not, just because you're on the same track as those guys. <laughs> But you know to He's be so right. With his put well, no, but, but to be right, he is. He is really nice with his put down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is, without <laughs> without Jeff, we would not be on that field. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know what I mean? We would never have the opportunity to be on that field and and play in that league. Um, and I know for a fact Jeff didn't have the results he wanted that night. But that's still um, what I'm trying to say is that was not a loss for us. That was still a huge mm -hmm. moment for us and the kids and. Gunner's Christmas present this year he cherishes the most is a picture that night he took with Kyle Larson. And your car's in the background. You know what I mean? I'll tell you what, you bring up the Kokomo race, and <clears throat> that was a turning point. I don't think we've seen the fruit of that turn right. yet, but that was, that was definitely the low point of the year. I mean, I was not a happy camper that night just because things weren't going the way we had hoped, and we were kind of fighting the car, and was getting to the point where you're just like starting to doubt and go, do you, you see a pattern here with race yeah. car driver? You, you think you're all that, you go good, something bad happens, then you're like, I can't do this. Um, and, uh, and so I was kind of having, having my doubts like, ah oh, man, like, you know, what do we got to do? Cause I think maybe we need to change, change driver. But every night after Kokomo, we made progress as a team and, and our team is pretty small. Um, one of the guys that I raced go-karts with a little bit and then later we reconnected in the Indy Lights series, like his dad would never let him race sprint cars, but he's always been a big sprint car fan and he's from Michigan, his name's Nick Bussell. And uh, it was at Kokomo that Nick got promoted to crew chief. Um, I kind of remember this. Despite having very little experience and he kind of looks at me and it's like Nick you know what I think we got to make a change like I just need to focus on trying to drive like I, I this is all too much for me to try to to try to quarterback yeah. this whole deal and race it and he's like well I, I don't I don't know what to do and I'm like well look at our qualifying effort neither do I <laughs> Like it can't go much worse, right? And and Nick's a like, pretty no matter what you change, you can't qualify behind us. You know? Yeah, right. Yeah, just about. And so Nick's pretty sharp when it comes to race cars, and he's he's a student of the sport. And you know, from that point forward, like we started building Nick's confidence little by little um, to to have ideas and and do something with them. And so like that's grown. Uh, and I, I think we're going to have a good working relationship there. Um, and then another big one was, was toward the end of the year, I was kind of at, at the place where I was like, you know what, maybe we need to try putting someone else in the car and just see what happens. Because if I'm the problem, I need to get the hell out of the way. Right. right. Um, and so I called Justin again, I was like, Hey man, uh, you want to come drive my car sometime? You know, I'll pay you. And he was like, hmm. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I got good engine. He's <laughs> like, yeah, you got, a, you got a good engine. But I don't necessarily agree that you're the problem. And my stock price isn't exactly at its peak at the moment. So I can't really afford to go get in something else and suck. He goes, I got this other race car here that's like the one he runs in his own personal team. He said, why don't we meet in Davenport, Iowa and put this car together and see what you think. And if you still think you're the problem, then you'll have a car I want to drive. And if not, he goes, I think it'll go a lot better. And so that was, that was the car we took to Charlotte and, uh, seen some big improvements. Yeah. I, I feel like a sprint car racer again. We've got, few other things we've got to get worked out that we've had nagging us all along and we're learning. Um, Brakes. Drive line. 
the drive line. But it shows itself on brakes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we got to get that worked out and, and just work on building some confidence again in the car um, because you kind of touched on, on racing. Like so much of driving a race car is just instinct. And so much of your instinct is based on experience behind you. And so, you know, as you enter a corner, you've got one race car that one race car to another for this first 30 feet of a corner might feel exactly the same. And when one does something really nasty to you and evil to you, as you enter the corner and another one doesn't, but they feel exactly the same leading up to that, you start to build kind of preemptive habits to combat whatever ill handling thing is about to come your way. And so I've got to re retrain myself. And the biggest thing we need to do really as a whole is just race more. Yeah. I mean, we don't race a lot. We raced, I think 15 nights this year and in Charlotte, the guys that we were race them with we're on for the most part night 60 to 90 and so our goal our goal for this coming season is to find a way to take it from 15 to 30 and uh and keep developing this new package well i think that's we're getting kind of long here so maybe a good spot to uh wrap this up since you brought us into the uh into the present here but i guess a few things in closing you know it's it's crazy how similar, whether it's racing or farming or what I do, how many, the, the challenges are the same. You know what I mean? Nothing worth doing is easy. Nothing no. worth doing is, is easy. And it's uh, myself, Aaron, Gunner, Bo, everybody, we've, I mean, we've had an absolute blast. I, I, I've told you time and time again, I wish there was more to do to help you out because over the course of the last three years, you've become a lot more than just a guy that we show up at the racetrack and hang out with. Hell, we hang out away from the racetrack way more than we ever hang out at the track, um, which is the one of the biggest gains for me. Just a good friend. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, um, your your help has been has been much appreciated, and we've certainly enjoyed bringing Dirt Perfect along for the ride. But um, worth a lot more than any of that, I think, is the relationship with Mike Simon and. Yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been it's been pretty cool. So, uh, no matter what, we got full intentions of racing together, like you just said, uh, with the restructuring of some of the, uh, I guess is it sanctioning bodies? Would that be the right way to put it? It's an exciting time. Series. In, it's an exciting time in the 410 sprint car world. Yeah, there's right a lot now. of opportunities there to try to capitalize on for sure. And um, I guess if anybody else wants to join the team or join the effort, we're open to that, Amy, or you're open to that as your team. Yeah, I? well, I mean, we're certainly open to it, but I, I guess maybe this is where we have to shift gears into our why. Yeah, um, which I think that's going to be the next the next episode. The next episode. Um, I, I, so and, stay and, tuned. And, well, season yeah, four. I, I <laughs> episode. Read the title. Read the title. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, encourage him. I encourage them to stay next to it because of our situations being business owners, uh, your situation of being the race car. I mean, we're at this point we're approaching this. Or I shouldn't say we. You're approaching this from a completely different perspective. Yeah, yeah. And so I think there's a lot of other a lot of other opportunities for people to get involved and get a lot more out of it than their name on the side of a race car. There has to be. Yeah. There has to be. I mean. Um, and honestly, we're looking for results on the track, but we're also looking for real results off the track. We're not talking about sales. We're not talking about sales. Well, sales might come because off of the track, it. but I think really, I mean, I feel like we got to give them a teaser here, Michael. What's the next episode going to be called? Uh, check the title. <laughs> <laughs> How are they supposed to check the title if they don't know what title to check? Well, well, that's usually where they get the episode number. Tune, <laughs> tune in next yeah, Sunday. Yeah, tune in next Sunday. Uh, no, I'm going to let you close with a teaser. Um, so the biggest challenge that I have as a business owner of a small excavating company to growing our business which would allow me to do more myself on the racing side of things is uh, finding the people that want to do this kind of work. And it's I, not even finding skilled tradespeople. It's just finding people yeah, to be able to train. To show up. And I look people back at when I was in high school 
as a good student because I had to be or I couldn't race. Um, if you would have asked me, even though I had an interest in construction and moving dirt since I was a little kid, uh, I would have told you that a heavy equipment operator was not, not a job for me. Right. And so we'll talk in the next episode about how we're going to try to fight that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about this as well, which is I think is one reason why you and I get along so well. And uh, hopefully between the two of us, we can make a difference because that's the ultimate, ultimate go. So, well, Jeff, I appreciate you. You actually took the time to drive three hours down here <laughs> to sit at this table with us. Two hours and 30 some minutes. 32 Michael, minutes. give I'm me some keep, credit. I'm trying to keep them legal <laughs> here. cops are trying to find them right now. <laughs> I can see Hoover back over there, time over a distance. That does not equal this. <laughs> but no, I appreciate you taking the time to come down here. Um, I mean, you got a cool history. I mean, yeah. the, the connections and I mean, Some just being there. just being one of the guys that's drove in to turn one and Indy at speed is yeah. that's an accomplishment in itself. It wasn't. I was it really, wasn't when really you hit lucky. The ball. Yeah, <laughs> I was really, really, really lucky. I mean, I'd love to sit here and say, hey, the reason I got to do that's because I worked harder than the next guy, or I was more talented than the next guy. You got the opportunity to make the best out of it. I was extremely, extremely lucky, but all stars lined up. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you got to show up to get lucky, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to put yourself out there and be and be uh, ready to accept failure if it don't work, mm -hmm. which is unfortunately what happens to most people. So, well, Jeff, thanks for coming down. Thanks for telling your story, and everybody needs to stay tuned because we'll pick you up on that. Yeah, episode. more to this. We got uh, we're up to the present, but we want to make a change in the future. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate goal. All right, thanks for listening, guys.